This talk is uh, titled The Trouble with P-Values, um, E-Reproducibility in Science. Uh, this is a talk, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the outline of the talk first. Um, first, I'm going to motivate the talk a bit. I'll provide a bit of an introduction. I'll talk about why p-values are uniform and why that's important and confusing sometimes. Um, I will explain the concept of statistical power. That's another important concept related to how one interprets p-values. I will talk about publication bias and how it affects uh, reproducibility in science. And then I'll give an example with location tests. So um, historically, um, like in the 1700s, Laplace wanted to use data to make decisions. So he looked at um, half a million uh, births and he wanted to ask, is it statistically significant that there's more boys being born um, than, than girls? And he came to, the answer he came to was yes, but notice that he had a lot of data to work with. Uh, and that's important, that's gonna be important in the talk. Um, Unfortunately, p-values have acquired a bad reputation. Um, they can be confusing and misleading, and uh, this reputation is not entirely warranted. Data analysis itself is a, is a complicated thing, uh, and p-values is just one way of looking at the data. If one uses them correctly, um, they're a very powerful tool. Um, this talk was motivated by an internal email question that, that was asked. Uh, by one of us um, who was confused as to how, it, with good cause, because it can be confusing if, if you, uh, they can be hard to get your head around. Uh, so I'm gonna try and provide, this talk is gonna be like an intuition builder. I'm gonna try and not to a lot, give a lot of definitions, just try and give intuition of how uh, p-values work. Uh, and then I'm gonna give an example of, of why um, misuse of p-values has led to a reproducibility crisis in science uh, with like hor uh, horrific numbers, really, like uh, in, in very recent meta studies in 2015 could only reproduce like 36% of results, for instance. Um, so this is uh, something I, like, I find very interesting and, and horrific, and, and it's, very, uh, it's a hot topic now. Uh, a paper from last year is, it, th this is like some a discussion that's happening right now. Um, about science and statistics. Um, so there are two main frameworks for data analysis, uh, the Bayesian and the Frequentist framework. And I'm not gonna like get into the rabbit hole of defending one or the other or given or explain them a lot because this is obviously a huge topic. I'm just gonna provide like the intuition that the Bayesian asks the question, what's the probability of a model that we want to um, use given some data, and the frequentist uh, framework as the opposite, less natural question, which is what's the probability of the data given our model? Um, Bayesian is conceptually easier, but often harder in practice. Uh, you have to be very specific with your assumptions. It can be very hard to compute numerically. Um, so that's one of the reasons um, that the frequentist model, even though it's less popular today, it, it's still it still is very useful. You can you can get a number with very easily with a, a with a, the Frequentist model, and then you just have to be clever as to how to interpret it or cautious, cautious. Um, don't rush to conclusions. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give a little advance of the of the final remarks that I'm gonna be here just so that you bear in, that we bear in mind throughout the talk is that there's no magic recipe in data analysis. There's no way to plug in a thing in a black box and, and get a number that, that is robust. You have to give good data, good assumptions, and you have to understand your problem to get robust con new quantitative conclusions. So uh, we want to draw inferences from our data. And a simple question is, uh, does the data support a hypothesis? Um, and the first step for, to do that is we summarize the data with a number. So we have uh, a, a vector of observations, and we want to first get a simple number that we call statistic, hence the word statistics. Um, an example is that we take the variance of the data and we just multiply it by uh, 
n minus 1, which is the n is the number of the, uh, the, the, the amount, the length of the data set. Um, and the second uh, step is that we use the statistic to try and determine whether the data supports our hypothesis. Um, so I'm going to now give a definition, and we're going to illustrate this definition, because the definition is a bit confusing itself. So, so the p-value is the probability that the sample statistic is smaller than the observed statistic, assuming or conditioned, is what this little thing says, this little hat, sideways hat says, on our model H0, which is called the null hypothesis. Um, and this is expressed in, in mathematics. It would be expressed like this. Um, and to compute this probability, we must we have to know the distribution of statistic. Uh, for example, if our data is normally distributed, um, which is often a good ex approximation, by the way, to, to for a lot of data, the statistic t that we we the, that we had here will be we have a chi-square distribution, and we're gonna show a little example of how these things are derived. So, for instance, we have um, data x that's normally distributed with mu mean mu and variance sigma, and if we apply this transformation, we, we subtract the mean and we divide by the standard deviation. This is now distributed as a normal distribution with a mean zero and, and standard deviation one. If we square this data, we get a chi-square distribution with parameter one, and if we sum this data, we get a chi-square distribution, and now we have a number, now we have statistic, um, uh, a chi-square distribution with parameter n because we had n equals 10 here. Um, the Wolfram language pro provides many built-in tests that automatically compute a statistic and know about underlying distribution to compute the p-value. So this is, this is what our framework does for you. And a modified version of the test statistic here, t, is what's used in the Pearson chi-square chi test, for instance. Um, so an, an example of how to use this, you, we have um, some data. And then we just ask, we, we ask a distribution fit test to, to, to does this, uh, does this um, can this be explained as a Maxwell distribution of some uh, with some parameter? Uh, and the answer is, is yes. Or rather, the answer is we don't reject the hypothesis. We can't falsify that. You can never give positive answers. Like, uh, we, this is a, in the, this is, you can only falsify the normal hypothesis because you can never say it's um, definitely true. Um, so uh, an important thing is that p-values are uniformly distributed. Um, and intuitively, I want to give an intuition of why that's the case. Um, this, p, this probability calculation, this p-value, gives the position of x uh, amongst a sorted sample drawn from the null hypothesis H0. Um, normalized by the total number of samples. Um, and if x is drawn itself from the same distribution, that's a typo, that should be h0, um, it will be distributed uniformly. Uh, intuitively, if you just have a number of samples and they all have the same distribution, if you swap them around, they, the, the, the order, the position in that in a sort of sample is uniformly distributed. You're equally likely to draw the tenth element in a sorted sample than the last element. Um, so that's why p-values are uniformly distributed. And the, I mean, we can see this here. Like if we subsample, we, we, we sample from a Pareto distribution, for, in, for instance. And then we subsample, we just choose random elements from that sample. Uh, if we compute the, the CDF, which is an efficient way of computing this probability, um, then it will be uniformly distributed. So now we the 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 next step is that we reject the the we reject the null hypothesis if this p value is smaller than a than a threshold that we call significance level. Uh, and this significance level has traditionally been set at five percent. Um, and this is something that's now being questioned. I'll talk about this later. Um, and crucially, this means that we have a false rejection rate of alpha, uh, of 5% in this case. Uh, because of choosing the significance level, even if our data comes from our distribution, we will always throw away, mistakenly throw away 5%. Um, so um, 
For example, if we have a collection of samples, we can we can we can again prove that this using distribution fit test that this thing is uniformly distributed. And for that reason, uh, we're gonna throw away um, significance level number of them. Um, so um, more on this. P, I said this before, p-values can only falsify hypotheses, not confirm them. So if the p-value is very small, it is unlikely that our hypothesis is true, um, I, e.g. that the data comes from the model. To lower the false rejection rate that we have, like this mistakenly thrown away of, of good samples, we, we can lower the significance level. So for instance, by default, we falsely reject 5% if we ask for the short test conclusion on a, on a sample that we've that we that we've created here, and we, and we count how many of them are are we're rejecting is it's five percent. If we lower the significance level to 0.5 percent, for instance, um, we reject 0.5 percent of them falsely. Um, so with this understanding of how this is a like an escapable fact of using p-values, we can. Um, Appreciate this SKCD joke. That is very, that is very representative of how p-values, of how people understand p-values, and uh, me, the media understands p-values. So this is these are some guys being asked to do some tests, and they go away and they do 20 tests uh, with a p-value that's one over 20, uh, with a significance level that's one over 20, and uh, one of them is significant. And they say, and, and the news will be that green jelly beans are linked to acne with 95% confidence. This is bollocks. Like the, this language is very misleading. Only 5% chance of coincidence. No, that's not that's not true. This is not asking a question. It's the 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 useful. What's useful if if this p value is very 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 small, then you can you have some confidence that this is true. Otherwise, you should be very careful with these conclusions. Um, so, thinking about the uh, let's talk, let's look about this let's look at this scary fact again. Um, this again, this is a very recent meta-analysis. They took a hundred papers published recently in psychology, uh, and these are like Nobel Prize statisticians have made these mistakes. So, like this is a mistake that, that that is really and has caused a crisis of faith in science. With good reason, in my in my opinion, because this is not just psychology, which is I mean nobody cares about. Uh, but in medicine, this happens as well. In pharmaceutical tests, this happens as well. So very very serious stuff. Um, and you know, seventy percent of them are wrong. Um, and this is d partly there are many contributing factors: p hacking, uh, like. We we see what we want to see. Like this, this is a very data analysis, very complicated. But um, but publication bias is, is uh, a a, a particular culprit that's kind of easy to to eliminate, uh, and it's uh, one of the main contribution contributing factors. So let's let's look at statistical power and how it works. Um, so we've seen that by lowering significance level, we can lower the false rejection rate. But if we want to lower the false acceptance rate, um, so the false negatives. Um, this is a bit trickier. So, so suppose we have some data distributed as H1, an alternative hypothesis, and we want to test whether it's distributed as H0, which is a null hypothesis. Um, and we're going to use the notation here a bit to also use these symbols to represent the distribution of the statistic. So we have our, we have our data, we aggregate it to a, to a number, and we're going to say that this, this is the distribution of this number. Um, so, and we're also going to assume um, a two-sided test. So we're going to reject not if not only if uh, the p-value is very small, but also very close to one. Um, so here we have h1, with, which is a normal distribution. H0 is uh, one zero. Here, sorry, zero one, and h1 is one one. So we have basically we can see here that we have um, um, two. Hypothesis that have a lot of overlap, so the the no and the alternative hypothesis is very similar. So it's going to be very difficult to tell one from the other, um, to to disentangle data that doesn't come from the no hypothesis uh, that from data that does. And this is the con this is what the concept of 
statistical power encodes. Um, beta is the probability that we falsely accept the null hypothesis. Um, so beta here is the Q1 and Q2 are the, the places at which we would cut off, um, at, which, at which we would reject uh, the, the null hypothesis here. And if we integrate the orange curve from Q1 to Q2, this is going to give us the probability um, that we falsely accept the null hypothesis, which is 0.82% here. Um, and the power is defined as 1 minus beta. So low power means our, both the, our null and our alternative hypothesis are very similar, and it's hard to tell them apart. And, when, and it's, in this scenario, it's very hard to, do, to do make any decisions, to, to, to make robust conclusions. Um, so, um, and it also obviously depends on the test statistic they use, but also on the data. Again, like if we have data that's like almost it's normally distribu distributed, but also, almost has the same mean, then you're not going to be able to tell them apart. Um, so here, just like, I just want to see that like you can do this computation with the distribution, but like if you sample from this distribution and do this counting that we did before, this probability using an empirical distribution, uh, you're going to get a very similar result for the power. It's 17%, 69.9%. Um, so um, publication bias is a very important contributor to this irreproducibility crisis. Um, what happens is that publication of negative results are suppressed. Uh, I, on, people only want to see, journals only want to see the things, like things like new things actually happening. And um, this results in most of the published ones being wrong. Um, and there's two necessary conditions for this. Uh, one is that the sort result is very rare. Um, so most results will be negative. Mo you try new things and it's hard to find new things. So most of the test, the science that you do is negative. You don't find, you don't find anything. Um, and then if we only publish those positive results, um, then most of them are going to be wrong. Um, and this is, um, let's, let's see an example. I want to do these illustrations because they're very, once you see plots, they're easy to understand. Um, we have a, the result that we, the sort result is rare, so 10%. And this is like, this is 10% is actually a huge number uh, for DNA studies, for instance. Like you're trying, loads of combinations of different base pairs and see if they're related to some phenotype or something. And you, like, it's going to be much lower. It's 0.1% or something. But like, let's assume it's 10% for, for the case, um, for the sake of the argument. And here we see that like, if we, uh, most, of a, most of the test statistics are going to be negative, uh, are going to be, there's nothing going on. H0 is the null hypothesis. And some of them are going to be something's going on. Um, and we, I'm using the, the same H1 as before, so the, the, the power is low. There's a lot of overlap between these two curves. Um, so if we reject the null hypothesis, which is the, what we usually, what, like the usual case in these studies, like we wanna, we're looking for something. So the null hypothesis is we find nothing. Um, and we only keep rejections, i.e. positive results, the, the ones that journals want to see. Um, we're going to see that um, only 6% are positive um, in this case. So all the rejections are the 6%. And remember, if, it was, if we only had it 0, it'd be 5%, because that's the significance level. The force, um, um, and only 27% of these are correct. Numbers slightly lower than the psychology study, but at the same ballpark, just randomly choosing 10%. Um, and here we see the histogram of what's actually going on. We had this, we had this histogram, and then we, we've literally rejected everything in the middle uh, that had a p-value smaller than these two thresholds. And what we're left with is this. And the blue stuff is the stuff that's correct. And the orange stuff is the stuff that's wrong. And because there was a much more orange stuff, most of the, stuff, most of the uh, results are wrong. Um, the power is 17%, probably that we reject given H1 is 27%. We can do the same sort of analysis directly um, using some base theorem. So this is like very basic, and this is like a, the toy Bayesian example analysis with, with uh, cancer rates. This is like the first example you, you see when you, when you learn uh, Bayesian, Bayesian stuff. And um, 
you you just apply Bayes' theorem. This is Bayes' theorem. What's the, if one? What, what's the probability of a correct result, assuming that we've rejected, uh, is given by the probability that we rejected, given that we had um, a sample from H1 times the probability of H1, which is very low, time divided by the probability that we reject. Um, and we could compute this. Uh, this is just to remind us what Q1 and Q2 were. Um, and we can compute this. Uh, these numbers by first looking at the true rejections, which are um, the probability that um, we reject given that we're in H1, um, i.e. significant results. Um, and then just to compare, we have the false rejections, which we expect to be alpha, uh, the significance level, and this is true. This is like a sanity check. Uh, we can also compute the other rejections, which is, again, probability that we reject given that we're in this mixture distribution that, we, that we've, that we've um, uh, defined here. So most of it is H0, and some of this distribution is H1. Effect frequency was, if you remember, was like 10%. And if we do this number, again, we get 27%. Um, in Bayesian terms, this is because the prior distribution for H1 is so low. I, it's hard to find a result. So the posterior is gonna it's gonna be hard to make that posterior high. Uh, we can only update our information so much. Um, so if we want to improve power, um, we can let's let's assume we improve power. And this is not not always easy because we 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 can find the case where you know it, it can be hard. Our data can be can be very stubborn or adversarial, but. If we manage to improve power, so we have an, uh, t another distribution H2, which is, uh, has a lot less overlap this time. Um, and we see that the power this time is very high, it's almost one. Um, if we look the distribution of sample statistics, we again see that like this time, the, there's a lot more orange, but the, but the green stuff, it doesn't overlap. Let's have the blue here, uh, the blue stuff here for comparison. And, um, Again, we play the same trick, only keep positive results. This time, um, we have 14% because we have much more stuff in the rejection area, the green stuff. Previously, it was 6%. And 70% of them are correct. So we've improved power, and this was a very easy. And, and we, again, same plot. We can see why this is true. We, the orange stuff that we were forcibly rejecting is here, but we have all this green stuff here that is correct results. Um, but note that because the prior was low to begin with, still, even with like almost 99.8% power, we can't do better than 70%. Um, so this is an important thing. And this is why it's crucial to publish negative results. Um, and another, another, I mean, a complementary thing to do is, is to raise the significance level, uh, is lower the significance level. Um, so let's take here 0.01%. Um, and in this case, again, same analysis, we get the, a similar picture that 67% of the results are correct, but the cost of failing to reject some of these samples from the alternative hypothesis. And we look at this picture again, and we see what's going on. We've just gone further, up, further away to the tails, and we see that... Um, that we're the, in this regime, we we managed to select more of the blue, more of the correct uh, uh, alternative hypothesis. Um, so I'm almost out of time. Um, let's just quickly look at an example of uh, we're trying to test two data sets that have the same mean, and this is a typical case in pharmaceutical tests. We have a control group and a drug uh, uh, and a drug group, drug, drugged group. And uh, we simulate this with a Cauchy distribution, which is heavy tailed, and, and hence it's going to have low power because it's going to be a little mixture of the two distributions. And uh, we just use location test um, and with a hypothesis test data and, and generate a hypothesis test data object that can query and use this to figure to apply all the tests that we have and, and see the short test conclusion. Um, and we see that we. Do, do not manage to reject in most of the cases, both with location test and with distribution fit test. But if we get a bigger sample, 
we will increase the power and we will be able to confidently uh, reject the tests. Um, so I'm very, I'm out of time. I'm just going to conclude closing remarks. These are quotes. The plural of anecdote is not data. Small data sets don't have a lot of information. The infer inferences one can draw are limited. Uh, data analysis is simply a dialogue with the data. This is, it's hard. We, you requires, it requires being very informed. And even when you are, you make mistakes. So one has to be very careful not to delude oneself into thinking that one is making informed decisions as a result of being quantitative. Just because you have number doesn't mean that like you should believe your number. Like you have to be conservative and cautious with, with, your, with your analysis. Um, and the recommendation, there's a current recommendation, 2017 uh, paper in Nature, that we should at least use 0.5%, so an order of magnitude lower. And that would help ameliorate some of these courses. But like there's still, data and I still hard, but this is, this is a, the current recommendation. Thank you very much. Sorry if I was.